We know what the world really is. Black and white. Nothing ever ends. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Sublime Primetime 2020, presented by the Writers Guild of America West and the Writers Guild Foundation in partnership with Variety and Final Draft. I'm Kelvin Yu, your host and moderator for the evening. And the panel now is going to feature Emmy nominees for the Outstanding Writing for a Limited Series, Movie, or Dramatic Special category. Without further ado, I'd like to intr uh, introduce our, our panel, our esteemed panel. I'm honored and thrilled. Um, Tanya Barfield, writer and producer from Mrs. America on FX. Susanna Grant, writer, co-creator, executive producer, and showrunner of Netflix's Unbelievable. Cord Jefferson, writer and executive story editor of Watchmen on HBO, and Damon Lindelof, writer, executive producer, and showrunner of HBO's Watchmen. Uh, not present, but hoping to be present. Uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna have them today are Michael Shabon and Ayelet Waldman, also co-creators of Netflix's Unbelievable. Thank you all um, for being here. And first and foremost, congratulations on all your nominations, your numerous nominations, and for continuing to uh, sort of entertain and edify us in, co in coronavirus quarantine. It's, um, I think it's a service that is uh, undervalued that are, are unsung. So thank you so much. It's been, it's been tremendous to um, be able to watch your creations. Uh, I'd love to start with Mrs. America. Um, tonight is the Republican National Convention. Um, and I just wanted to ask you a question. You know, you might, let's say you, you end up after this panel going and sitting on your couch and watching uh, some clips from that. You might watch that with part of your brain. And yet your job as a writer is to embody and empathize and humanize Phyllis Schlafly and people. Um, and, and you did so beautifully. You dimensionalized the opponents as well as the champions of the ERA. Can you, can you speak a little bit about that experience and um, what that means as, in terms of having a job like that every day? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that, thank you. I think it's, um, it's incumbent upon a writer to do that, to humanize their protagonist. Um, and so despite the fact that Phyllis was so different from m most of the writers in the room, you know, we really wanted to figure out how can we tell her story in a way that we don't write her off? Yeah. And how can we make her a worthy opponent for the people that, um, many, or if not probably all of us identified with being the feminists. So that was really the, um, the goal there. And so we dove into her, you know, Phyllis is quite prolific. So we read her, mm -hmm. you know, her books and stuff like that. And just sort of like dove in there in a way to try to understand her. But I think that also in addition to that, one of the goals of the show was to see how can we show all the, you know, differing voices in the feminists as well, yes. you know, and how can we mine that and really show that we're not just because that we're women and maybe aligned with a political belief, we're not all the same. We're not sort of a monolithic voice, mm -hmm. you know, which is why we have a number of black women in the show because it's often time, it's just like, oh, it's you, the one black woman that says this one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really the goal is to just show a multifaceted story. Um, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. I, you know, I guess it's just on the brain because of just clips from Twitter and the RNC and everything. And I, you know, I, I thought what you're talking about in terms of our intersectionality, I thought, I thought Mrs. America was one of the most successful, if not easily the most successful um, sort of snapshots of that intersectionality you had fringe movements versus moderate movements. You had uh, religious sort of intra fighting within the party. You had some racial tensions um, within the feminist women's lib movement. Um, how Did you guys ever wrestle with how to bring that to a 2020 audience and to what extent that might chafe with the current movement or were you locked in and zoomed into what you were writing and who you were writing? I think that it was really important and um, sort of uh, powerful to go into that because, you know, we were writing the show about a year and a half ago. And so long before anyone, you know, this current 
um, election, you know, where we saw a number of women, you know, as well as people of color um, as candidates. You know, we were writing this before that, but we were also sort of in the wake still of 2016. Sure. and trying to figure out, well, what happened there, really? And I think the fault lines, you know, between white women, feminists, and Black feminists go back decades. You know, they really go back to the suffragist movement, you know, um, in the 1800s. But we also see that um, in the 70s in the second wave feminists. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you could think of like some of what we were trying to do as writers is like, how do we understand today? You know, whether it's the rise of the religious right, whether it's pandering to racists in order to galvanize your base, whether it's sort of like, what is the tussle between um, white feminists and black feminists and how do we, you know, understand that? People often said, oh, we didn't know that your show was about race because it's about women. And it's like, no, actually our show is about race but it's a different way of looking at it because we're really looking at intersexuality. We're really looking at like, what is it to be a woman that's also black or to yeah. be a black person that's also a woman? And I think that is- You don't have to choose. You don't have to choose. Yeah, you, don't have to choose <laughs> yeah. you know, and we get into a little bit of that in terms of other groups, you know, as well throughout the show. So I mm -hmm. think that that is something that we were really trying to delve into is um, it, those those questions exactly. Yeah. You know, speaking of perspective, um, it, um, Susanna, I, um, I'm glad you, you joined us, Susanna. We were uh, wondering, hopefully, hoping you, you would make it. I'm, I'm glad to see your face. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, no problem. We, um, I, I, <laughs> I Googled female cop shows earlier okay. this afternoon. <laughs> you found Cagney and Lacey? Yeah, well, I was looking for Cagney and Lacey or for Cold Case or things like that. And I, what I found was a couple of lists of the hottest female cop shows in history or the, the sexiest female cop shows. And it, and it struck me that um, there's actually something quite novel about, about two female cops um, and, and it being well done. And I wanted to ask you about per, uh, narrative perspective. And, and what it meant to write a show. You know, you, you hear representation matters quite a bit in terms of people of color or LGBT, often in terms of casting. But in terms of sexual assault, I, I found it incredibly empowering um, to see it on screen, to see a story told by women, through women, for women, um, well, for everybody, but through women characters. And um, did, you, did you, in terms of setting the narrative, did you uh, find that that was a, a novel thing in terms of female cops and not having a lot of uh, representation in the past? Or was that something that, that you uh, modeled off of something else or? You know, I didn't really think a great deal about how female cops had been. I, it, it's not something that's been a big part of my viewing diet, the female cop <laughs> genre. Um, but I, 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 I was, I didn't, I feel like a lot of, um, portrayals of women who are in traditionally men, male professions, which is, you know, virtually every profession, um, just adopt a very male attitude. I had not seen a lot of women, and I certainly haven't seen female partnerships that felt okay. like the partnerships I know in life, the, the sort of one plus one equals five partnerships that can happen when uh, a couple of really dedicated people of any gender get together and, and really click, but, but not in a way that sort of adopted all the mannerisms of thing of, of a typical male perspective. You know, they are very much yeah. women. Um, yeah. uh, and the fact that there, you know, there was, there's a ton of um, data out there about the correlation between how many women are on a force and how serious sexual assault is taken within that yeah. within that department I mean the more women who are the more women cops you have in your department the more investigations um, sexual assault will get it's just a it's a straight straight up correlation across the board so that felt worth honoring you know and yeah. acknowledging and there's also you know an extent to which training is a huge factor in this as well you know and I, I think a lot about the conversation we're having about policing in our culture now, which is overdue and necessary. 
Um, and, and certainly I see the issue of training being a, a huge issue. Um, and that was really, that was a huge, that was a big problem in the first investigators on that one half of the story. I mean, these two men who had no idea how to right. talk to someone who'd been through a sexual assault. Yeah, I wouldn't ask you to comment on police reform if, you know, unless you felt comfortable doing it. But, um, but in terms of like the, the missing link in that, in that um, compare and contrast, and, you know, you have sort of the identity of the, the gender of the cops, but you also have the lack of training and the lack of empathy that's sort of systemically baked in. And, you know, I guess I would ask you, does the show offer or do you feel that they're after, after training, what, what is what, what are the baby steps toward a better uh, policing of these incidents? And what, what, what is the next sort of um, ABC of how we get to a better world? Well, there are departments in the country that are doing, you know, making significant changes that are adopting trauma-based training, um, which is a, a huge reversal from how a lot of the um, standard uh, interview process works in, in policing. You know, it's a very different way of approaching a victim. Um, there's just an understanding of what happens to the brain in that kind of trauma that can scramble a narrative, will often scramble a narrative. So there are a lot of departments that are starting to incorporate that training. There yeah. are really great um, advocacy groups that are providing that to departments. Obviously, there's a long way to go. But, you know, there, there are places like the, the New York Special Victims Unit has completely physically redesigned their space because they realized that it, the space which was normal to them was hostile to uh, sexual assault mm -hmm. victims. So there are places that are making good changes, not, not, not nearly enough and not as quickly as we need them to happen. But it's, it's happening. I have writer questions for you as well. I'm, I'm going to jump quick. I'll be back. I'll, I just I'll jump quickly to, to Watchmen. I, there's so much written and so much um, scholarship on, on the show. I mean, going back to the graphic novel and the, and the film as well. And I, I, I wanted to ask you guys sort of a in the weeds question. And then we, you know, we can zoom out and talk geopolitics if we want to. But I, I, you, this show, as well as other shows that you've worked on, Damon, I feel like uh, traffics in what I call the art of good confusion like not not every not every show we go to for that i think most shows look to surprise their audience they look for unexpected things but they don't look for confusion whereas when i when i tend to go to a damon lindelof show i think i tend to look to be confused and i was wondering if there's an artistry to that um that you understand maybe in sort of leftovers to lost that you understand how far of a leash you can give an audience before they're completely lost at sea or if, if you're sort of just always playing with fire. Um, and Cord, to your experience too, with your, your sort of lyrical episode that sort of was almost like a like jazz, like how do you know that the audience is in lockstep with you? And I'm just curious, this is very much in the weeds, Cord, sort of like, you know, whatever. The, but is there any answer that you can offer on that? I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll just say it's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress. There's never, mm -hmm there's never a sense of having nailed it. Uh, the kind of storytelling that I'm really drawn to is storytelling that is authentic to our experience in life, which is that we're confused a lot of the time and we're constantly mm -hmm. intersecting with other people's stories and we don't know at what point they are in their story. And so we're all the protagonists of, of our own, uh, you know, epic television show until we get canceled. And I think that the idea of hopping around and, and telling shows from different perspectives. Um, Susanna um, could have just decided to say, let's do an episode from the perspective of, you know, of the, of the cops that she was just describing, Bill F Fager Baker and, you know, those guys. And we could have watched them wake up at home and, you know, make cereal for their kids. And, um, but, but, but that wasn't the perspective that they chose from. And I think very we always start from whose episode is this and and again i you know i, I think that i have to say you know and i speak i think i speak for cord and certainly most of the writers on watchmen we're huge fans of both of these shows uh unbelievable and mrs america and i think that they they both do an incredible job of of the switching of a point of view in particular uh, tanya's episode is all about just Shirley, who is 
you know, sort of a, uh, you know, uh, a supporting character in many of the other episodes, but this one episode, she gets to, uh, we, we get to, to experience the world through her perspective. And I think it's so important to do it that way. And so you get into very non-sequential storytelling when you're trying to do it from multiple perspectives that can be confusing to people. People want to know, who am I? And our answer tends to be, you're everybody. Um, and it's our job to create some some degree of empathy for, for whoever shoes you're in. And just to pivot to Cord, w- one of the reasons that I fell in love with his writing was he wrote an episode of Master of None called New York, I Love You, that basically did what I'm describing around nine times in the space of a single episode. Kelvin, Kelvin um, is familiar with Master of yeah. None. <laughs> I, I, was yeah. an, I was an actor on that. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. well, there yeah. you go. And But I, I was like, who, how'd they do that? And so, you know, constantly watching and learning. And I think that uh, the downside is people will often say about things that I've written, what the fuck is going on? Um, Mm -hmm. But but sometimes sometimes it's a positive. uh, And uh, because that's the way that I feel in life most of the time. (laughs) Yeah, I think that to to I'm one of those people. I agree with you, Kelvin. I think you said good confusion in that. You know, I was a huge Leftovers fan before I met Damon. And one of the stories that he told in the Watchmen Room that, that sticks with me about his process and, and, and sort of how he goes into making stuff was, um, I don't know if, if you guys remember the Leftovers scene in which Carrie Coon's character um, puts, on the, puts on the bulletproof vest and has the prostitute shoot her in the chest you do I, I don't know if anybody out there remembers this scene but that was one of my favorite scenes of, of leftovers and i thought it was so weird and it stuck with me and sort of i just found it haunting and like love that episode um and we were we were talking about i have no idea how we got on the topic one day in watchman room but damon said that he pitched that he pitched that scene that that carrie coons would ask this prostitute to shoot at her and uh tom parada said, okay, we could put that in, but why does she do that? And Damon said, I don't know why. I just think it, it feels right. It feels like a, it feels like the right thing for her to do. And Tom was like, okay, I'm willing to like cede control over this and let you put that in, but why, what is the intellectual reason for why she does that? And Damon just kept saying like, I don't know why it just feels, it feels like that's what should ha- happen. And you know, I, I think that sort of that was a lesson for me in what Damon was looking for in his storytelling was sort of following that instinct and that emotion and that this feels right, even though it may be confusing to people, it feels right to me and I want to go down that path and follow that instinct. And I think that, you know, I remember that scene and loved it because I sort of was in the same way. It was good confusing. I don't know why she's doing this, but there's something that speaks to me about this particular scene. And so I just need to follow that. And I think that that was, you know, that was a huge part of the reason why I wanted to work with Damon in the first place. And, and one of the reasons that I'm just such a fan of his. That's amazing. I, um, more on that. I, I wanted to, uh, particularly for Susanna and Tanya, um, I wanted to get into this co- conversation about research. I recently heard Jill Lepore, the historian, talk about the difficulty of not deciding what goes in her history, her history but what, go- what doesn't go in her history and um, that she compared it to a clothing line. And if it sort of hung on the clothing line, then it belonged everything from the Boston Tea Party to Southern Dixiecrats to Black Lives Matter. It, it ends up in her history, but she had to leave out a ton of stuff. Both of you guys had an embarrassment of riches of statistics and data. And I just, can you speak a little to the struggle of what makes it in and the sad, sad, uh, you know, editing room floor of what doesn't, uh, even before the editing room floor, the editing room floor of your mind and the editing floor of your reading. Um, you know, some of the statistics that were, that found their way into Unbelievable were jaw-dropping. The 40% of cops who have domestic violence incidents in their homes is like finding out that your vet has killed three dogs in his free time or something. It just made no sense to me, you know, that that, that's, that, that statistic was true. I had to rewind it. Um, can you speak a little bit to how you culled and how you were able to, to find it into a narrative? Yeah, I've done a, I've done a couple things based on real events and you know there are the facts that you know without which you're not actually telling the story there are the ones that absolutely have to go in and 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 those sort of go up on that Jill Lepore 
um, laundry line. And then there are the things like that statistic that you read and think, holy shit, what? And, and how do I, how do I weave this in? And how do I, and you know, you, it always has to, it always has to fit organically into the life of your characters. Nobody wants to go to a didactic lesson on statistics, but you know, I, I think that particular one formed an interesting, it was, it was toward the beginning of an interesting bond between these two detectives and the, the perspectives they brought to their work. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit kind of like by feel, honestly, aside from the ones that you absolutely need to tell the story truthfully and um, with some integrity. Then there's all that other, and I didn't, you know, Tanya, you had, <laughs> you were dealing with a hell of a lot more than I was. Um, so it was probably a little tougher for you, but um, I, I, you have that pool of it. And then I tend to tell the story from the character's point of view. And you know the things you want to draw in, you know the moments or ideas or data. Um, that are alive for you and heart sort of have that gut feeling that, you know, the prostitute with the gun had for Damon, like that just feels right for this. And, and you find a way, but, but I always feel like it has to be through a character driven story or, or it won't really sure. feel organic to it. I, I, we're going to talk to Tanya for about it because I wanted to ask about delegates. And I heard you say in another interview about learning about yeah. convention politics and <laughs> that, but before we jump to that, speaking of what Cord had mentioned about, sort of neck down writing, like, you know, gut right. writing. Right. Um, how, you know, you read this article in ProPublica. How do you know that you want to make it? How do you know you're just like, because this I, is the next I four years it, of my, you felt Because it, I right? felt it completely neck down. It was just yeah. a pure, I, all my decisions are made in my gut. Any, yeah. Anything I decide to do from my head, I abandon four days later. So, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it just, um, and, and probably I think a lot of, a lot of us are, drawn to things on that level for reasons we don't really understand but there's yeah. there's something that that i mean i know intellectually that stories about the abuse of power will always get me i'm i'm you know it connects to a rage place in me that will always be alive i think um so it had that but uh, you know it had it had so many other things that that just kept me up yeah that's what you're looking for. Tanya, um, yeah. yeah, speak to like this wealth of information finding its way into a 58 minute episode of television. Not 58 minutes, much less. <laughs> much less, right. And right. I only say that because sometimes it was a struggle to figure out how am I gonna tell Shirley's story in 22 minutes because it's half an episode. But I do think that what, you know, I think it's the same as what Susanna just said. A, sort of like your intuitive pull and what Damon and Cord said as well. It's like you're, you, even in research, there is that sort of what, what is pulling me intuitively? You know, there is, as Susanna said, the stuff you have to put in, like I have to put this in, I have to put the delegates in, in order for it to make sense. But I think um, for me anyways, I learned very young as a Black girl, like I have to look at the footnotes of history if I'm going to find my story. My story is not in the books, it's in the footnotes to the books. Okay. And now of course, the wonderful thing is that's changing is that we will like, you know, start to see, we, we have started to see stories of, of um, that are not part of the patriarchy that are, you know, in the history books, but for the most part, they're not. And, you know, we all know that to most people, Shirley Chisholm was a, a footnote. You know, many right. people knew about her, but most people did not. So I think that I've, I approach research from that place of what is the story that I'm not being told. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that, um, one of the moments in the episode that meant a lot to me that was, you know, as has been said, by the other writers gone on instinct is this moment where Shirley looks in the vent for the bug. Mm. And that was all from my mind. And it mm. came from when I went to, so the writer's room was in LA, I live in New York. Um, and I was, I would travel back on the weekends uh, to see, to see my family. But so there's a, the Shirley Chisholm papers are in the Brooklyn 
college library, but they're not open on the weekends. Um, or something, maybe the librarian was on vacation. And anyway, something happened. So I stayed a little extra to go to the library and I was so excited. I was like, I'm gonna find the Shirley Chisholm jewels. And so I found a lot of stuff. But one of the things that I found was an empty FBI file. And I was like, there were two. And I was like, why are the FBI files empty? What was taken out? <laughs> what are we not supposed to see? in these FBI files. And there was a photo of her with Bobby Seal. And so from there, I was like, what is she doing with Bobby Seal? That's so interesting. And that led to the mm. awareness, you know, that's also documented in her, in um, her um, autobiography about the Black Panther, her, right. her, you know, that she was endorsed by the Black Panthers. And even though that only became one line in the script, at one point it was a whole sure. scene. Sure. Um, and it became one line in the script just to create that sort of sense that there's, that this is a full character. You're only getting 20 yes. whatever minutes of her, but there's so much more because she is a full person. Yeah, that's great. That, that, that brings me to Cord and, and Damon and Ta-Nehisi Coates and Tulsa 1921. And how, how does that fuse together? And how do you have the wherewithal to know that this sauce is going to go with this dish and it's not going to be gross and weird. Like it's, it somehow all came together deliciously. Um, how, how did you have, how did you know and how did you have the fate to, um, to bring those, all this, as well as the source material that is beloved? Um, how did you, how did you do that research and bring it all together? I, I, I respectfully actually think that maybe that question is better answered than by Cord than by me because I was coming to Watchmen with a great deal of intention, but he is the first, one of the first people that I talked to who was outside this very intimate bubble of, you know, Watchmen nerds, um, where I, where I said, I, I think this is what the show could be about. And I, and, and my, my perception of, of that conversation was that Cord was equal parts concerned and trusting. Um, and that's why I hired him. I think that there were other writers that I met with <laughs> who were sort of like, sure, you're talking about ta Coates, cool. Like, um, that I didn't hire um, because everything that you just said, Kelvin, is exactly right, which is I, I do feel that unfortunately, but, per, but entirely fairly, we have to be wary of people who look like me talking about ta Coates um, are, it's not just about intention. Um, it's also about like, is, is this just going to be basically, you know, the Damon Lindelof virtue signaling show, or, mm. or is it going to be, per, is it going to be performative? How can we, how can we take these ideas and, and make them feel authentic? Um, mm -hmm. And like, and uh, so uh, a lot has been talked about the, the, the writer's room that made Watchmen, but the, the only reason that it worked is that I seated, you know, the drive, the the steering wheel, um, and uh, to to Cord and the other incredible writers in that room, and um, it was hard because I'm so used to driving. Um, but the only reason that it, we didn't veer off the road and, and go over a cliff was was be, because you know there was trust flowing on both sides. Mm. I think that you know it. it I think that. Maybe on its face, it seems like it that the two don't fit, like the Tulsa, the Tulsa massacre. How does that fit with a superhero show? And I think that you know, for but I was not a huge comic books fan when I was growing up. I knew a little bit about it, but but you know, the more that I started reading about it after I joined Watchmen, and, and you know, the stuff that I thought about before, the stuff that I knew about comic books before, felt like you know, so much of comics, like like if you think about the X Men. The X-Men, when I ever watched it, you know, I always thought that the X-Men was allegory, that the X-Men felt very much to me, and I've since gone and done some research about this, and it was to the writers at the time, uh, an allegory about, you know, Martin Luther King versus Malcolm X, and the, 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 the split between those two factions about how to handle oppression in America. And so you had one group of wow. mutants 
that were about assimilation, right? And that we should just learn to get along with, with all the normal humans. And the other group of mutants were saying like, actually we're more powerful than these people and we should overthrow them and, and run the world the way that we see fit. And so to me, you know, a, sh a, a superhero show that just made that subtext text was really exciting to me. Like, like yeah. take those, let's, let's, let's stop making that stuff subtext and make a text. And the more that I thought about it on those terms, one of the, one of the things that Damon uh, had, one of the ideas that Damon had at the beginning of the show was that he said, you know, this is, I want to make this relatively minor character in the, in the um, original text, Hooded Justice, I want that person to be black. And so I went and read, the, I, I think that Damon said that the first, the first time we started talking about the idea. And so I went and read Watchmen, which I had never read before. And that idea was thrilling to me because if you, if you don't know from the original text or, or if you haven't seen the show, that the Hooded, Hooded Justice is the original masked vigilante. The first superhero is Hooded Justice. And so the more that I thought about it, marrying sort of the real world of American racism with this sort of fantastical superhero show, it made sense because, you know, of course the first superhero, like who is going to be the person that's looking for extra judicial justice, right? Who is going to be the person that in 1930s America is not going to be able to obtain justice through traditional means, is not going to be able to go to the police or the courts and like find justice. And of course that person isn't going to look like Bruce Wayne. That person is going to look like a black person. That person is going to be a person of color, right? Like, of right. course, that's going to be the first superhero. Right. And so just the, the more that we started talking about it, the more we started sort of putting those ideas together, it seemed like less oil and vinegary. But it, it felt like, oh, no, this is like a perfect marriage of these two mm -hmm. ideas and concepts. It's funny. It's, uh, American history is constantly reappropriated for superhero purposes from like Wonder Woman to, you know, even like Forrest Gump. But they always seem to sort of skirt around the, the race relations of it all. Um, I actually think Cavalier and Clay, it's a shame that Michael's not on with us, is one of the great examples of incorporating race relations into that reappropriation. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a connective tissue amongst all, everything that's represented here on the panel today. And, and it, it has to do with resetting structure, structures of power, to be honest, you know, to less, greater and lesser degrees or in different qualities. And um, I, I kind of want to go back to Shirley Chisholm and talk about this, you know, that episode and, and Shirley's uh, run in general are very much about co the politics of compromise versus politics of conviction. It's sort of a Bernie Biden kind of dichotomy. It's, um, I'm annoyingly going to read very quickly a, a, a quote from Barack Obama on the Mark Maron podcast from 2015. Do you know what I'm going to read by any chance? Anyway, he says, sometimes the task of government is to make incremental improvements or to steer the ocean liner two degrees so that in 10 years from now, we're in a different place. But in the moment, people feel like we need 50 degree turn, not a two degree turn. And you say, well, I if I turn 50 degrees, the whole ship turns over. You can't turn 50 degrees because democracies don't turn 50 degrees. Now, in his defense, I don't know that Barack Obama feels like that in 2020 as we sit here. <laughs> but in 2015, he felt like that. And obviously, a lot has changed. But I, it, I'm, just, I'm just bringing it up to speak to um, what I think that episode was about. To, to some extent, Watchmen and Unbelievable as well is this um, tectonic shifting that we're seeing. And I'll shut up, but the last thing I have to say is that in comedy where I, I pay my bills, there is a valence changing of what kinds of stories we wanna tell in comedy, what's appropriate, what's funny, what's not funny. Um, are you feeling that as writers as well, that, that the ground underneath you is shifting? And I guess I'll start with Tanya and with Shirley and that, that conversation about 50 degree turns versus two degree turns. That's interesting. Well, it reminds me, just before we get to that, it reminds me that this, what's so great about this category and the people on this panel is that, and, you know, I think in the whole category, it's, it's all these really different shows. I mean, I yeah. think the, probably the only thing that we have in common is that they're, they're all female protagonists, which is actually not a lot to have in common. True. It's just rare. But yeah. I think that... Um, but it's all, all the shows are sort of pushing, pushing the envelope a little bit yes. in a way that's really exciting. Um, so, so in terms of Shirley and the, one of the things that excited me about being able to tell this story is to be able to represent the two degrees turn and the 50 degrees. Sure. You know, and it's sort of like the Overton window in the sense that like you need the fringe radicals to push 
mainstream politics a little bit more farther than they would normally go. Mm -hmm. You know, you need the Bernies to push the Bidens. Mm -hmm. You need the Malcolm X's to push the Martin Luther Kings. Mm -hmm. You need the, you know, surely, and Phyllis in her own right, she pushed the sure. right. Um, and so, and then what, what, but so, so I think that's very interesting. I think the sort of conversation is interesting. And that's what we try to do in the show is to have that real conversation and to try to make all the sides valid. Obviously in the Shirley episode, you're more in Shirley's point of view and you're rooting for her to win. But I don't think you're rooting for her to win at the expense of really thinking Bella has an excellent point, Yes, you know, and that that is something that makes a lot of sense. And so that was that the show, I think what we wanted to do, and even with in, in the Phyllis camp as well, you know, showing the homewakers and humanizing, you know, that side is that we're trying to exist in the gray. Yeah. We're trying to exist in the nuance that there aren't clear cut answer. Were there lively that conversations? It is very messy. Yeah. Oh my goodness. There were lively conversations. And in fact, we had to shut the writer's room down for two days, I think, because wow. we got into intersectionalism. Wow. And we, none of us knew each other. It was a writer's room where no one knew anyone. And no one knew. Davi hired. Um, she didn't know anyone on the staff. And so we got it. It was a very diverse room. And we really got in it. And I don't think the show was originally about intersection. It was meant to be about, you know, intersectionality. But I think that what Davi saw is that there is a greater story underneath the original story and all of that should be part of the story. And so not let's not write black women out of feminism That's the right. way that has happened for years. Let's actually tell that story and include that. But so anyways, we got into this thing where it was like, where are the minor characters? Where are the other people? What are, why aren't we telling them story? And I was like, what do I have to offer here? And I remember one day, Davi and I, we, we went into the hall and we were discouraged and we both sat down on the floor and she just said, it's really hard to tell messy, complicated stories where the people that you root for don't always agree. They have different ideas. And this is, you know, what's gone on in this country for so long. It's really hard. It would be easier to tell a more typical story with clear this is good, this is bad, this is what I agree with, this is what I don't. And I remember thinking at that time, okay, here it goes, here's the moment where it's like, thank you, but no thank you, Tanya Barfield, we value your black opinion, but now our ears are gonna turn off and you're just gonna be the silent person in the room or the person that speaks, but that, like in a, the frequency of your voice is not you know, hearable. Like, I felt like that was what's going to happen because I had experienced that in other situations. And it was to my great surprise that that didn't happen. Wow. That literally the writer's room shut down so we could talk about intersectional feminism. Mm -hmm. And so we could like tussle with it. And we did. And it was hard and it was messy and it was gray. A lot of, and then we got through it and now we're all like best friends. I didn't think I could like your show anymore. I mean, the, the, the fact that it's it found its way on the page and then it found its way on the screen and then it found its way into my brain. It's, it, that's, uh, it worked, just so you know, it worked. Um, uh, Susanna, do you want to speak a little bit to this, uh, this resetting of power and how this is sort of like coming up through storytelling and how that might have worked in your room? Yeah, but first I want to say I love that story, Tanya. <laughs> love you. that you guys dug in and had that, that sort of, goes to what I want to say, which is that my, my sense in drama is maybe that it's, it's um, the opposite of what I sense happening in comedy in which the lane seems to be getting narrower of, of what is funny. Um, I feel like the, the room is expanding, you know, and the hunger for that difficult conversation that you guys dug into um, is just growing and you see I mean the reception of all these shows none of them is easy none of them I, I I'm not sure any one of them would have been made as they were made you know 
five years ago, even. I feel like there's a, you know, it's reflective of where we're going as a culture and not just our country, but globally, you know, there's a huge young population out there that really, from my perspective on this one issue of, of sexual assault that really wants to just like pull up all the furniture and find all the crap that's been hiding underneath there and pull it out and get, get messy with it, you know, and see what we've swept into the corners for, for, you know, generations and, and clean it up and uh, start to clean it up. It's not easy, you know? And so I feel like, I mean, I get really excited watching your guys' shows, watching so many of these shows. And the, the other thing is this great format too, the limited series in which you have the time to spend 22 minutes on Shirley, you know, um, which you, you wouldn't, in in the prior, I like in a, in a film, obviously, she'd get what, eight maximum, you know? Um, and then it it's just allowing for uh, more expansive storytelling that allows for these off moments that are where the new information, new perspective, new connection can start to happen. So I, I love the limited series. I think from a writing perspective, it's really exciting. Yeah, it's basically a 10 hour movie. Yeah, so Sometimes yeah. you get to make a 10 hour movie that people watch. Um, for Watchmen, did, 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 was there an experience in the room? Obviously, you kind of spoke to it already, Damon, that you were looking to be challenged um, because you were not looking to virtue signal and you were not looking to check a box. Um, I do think that the show is a master class in diversity casting because it did not feel perfunctory. It felt like it was embedded in the stories of the people whose faces were on screen. It wasn't just, oh, what if the next door neighbor is Indian? Um, you know, and so I, but did you, did you, in your experience of it as writers, did you also feel a shifting of power? And is, is that happening to you as writers as you, as you meander through this new landscape? I think that something that Tanya touched on uh, in, in her story, I think, felt reminiscent of my experience in, in the Watchmen room, which is that, you know, I think that many of us probably have that experience of being sort of the wallpaper, the minority wallpaper that you're describing, Tanya, where sort of they bring in one black person or one woman or one queer person and they say, okay, we've got that covered. Um, that checks all the boxes. And we're gonna ask this person about what the black experience is, even though there's only one of them. Like you speak right. for the entirety of the black experience. We speak for the entirety of the woman's experience. Right. Um, we didn't have that in the room at all, which was, um, which felt great. And then beyond that though, th there's an important step beyond that, which you described Tanya, which is that once the showrunner does that, then that showrunner has to drop their ego and say like, now I'm going to actually listen to what you're saying and hear you and, and let, let, let your opinion resonate with me and l allow it to change my ideas and my perceptions and, my, and what I want to do with the show. And I think that's sort of like the, all with the, that's the incredibly important second step besides once you, once you hire the people then you need to respect them enough to listen to them. And so I think that, that I felt that, I felt that in Damon's room very much. And this isn't just a, just to effusively praise him. This is just the, the, the fact of the matter that, that, you know, I think that allow me to speak, speak on this Damon, but I know how important Watchmen was to Damon, you know, in our first discussion of the material, he talked about how he read that with his father when he was a child and his dad would buy issues of Watchmen as it was coming out and they would read it together. And that's, it's an incredibly important uh, piece of art to him. And so he came into it, holding on to it very tightly. And I think was, uh, was very afraid at, at ceding some control to people, but he did it, as he said. And um, I think the, the product was all the better for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I would just add that, um, and, and again, I think that, um, that, that Tanya and Susanna and, and, and Cord and many others have, have said this much better than I'm about to, but I think that when you're writing uncomfortable material, you have to acknowledge that the process of writing it is going to be uncomfortable. And when you're writing in a room, in the case of Watchmen, 
you know, we had different iterations of the room. The first room that basically we brought on to, to, to figure out what the entire series was going to be before we even wrote a pilot. There were a dozen of us in that room. Um, and, um, and everybody felt very strongly about an, any number of different issues. And everybody start, but we were all united in this feeling of, of real passion and ownership and authorship. And so this idea, that's what you're really solving for is, can we come away from this process that is, that is really a collective and a collaboration? Um, I'm not saying this uh, uh, to be modest. I have an insanely toxic ego, but this was one of the greatest collaborations that I've ever been a part of. And the show is better for it because it was, it functioned more like a jury room does where I was a four, I was the four person but we all had to reach some level of unanimous consent in order to proceed. And at once everyone started to feel the power of knowing that they could be the juror who was like, I'm not ready to acquit um, or I'm ready to convict on, an, on any given idea, that process was immensely uncomfortable. And I think that everybody wants to be in a safe space, right? In a space where, um, where they feel comfort, comfortable and valued. But when you're in a room uh, in this, you know, in, 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 in the midst of this kind of material, you have to sort of acknowledge that you're going to feel uncomfortable constantly. And when, when do you call a timeout and say, I need to step outside of the show and basically just say, sorry, like I completely and totally fucked that up. Like my naivete or oh, ignorance. I think we use this word ignorance and we don't fully understand it. We, we sometimes use the word ignorance to excuse somebody who doesn't know what they're supposed to know. But I've always, maybe this was a miscue when I was younger, but I've always thought of ignorance as you are willfully ignoring something that you mm. should know. And, I, and it's not the writer's job to teach me stuff that I should know. When I start to get a sense of, I've just said something that's making other people uncomfortable Am I going to call them out and say, why are you uncomfortable? Or am I going to mm. go home and Google it and, and, and try to figure out what, what I'm up to? At the same time, you, ha you, know, you have to function in that space with the excitement of a bull in a china shop, because you know, mm -hmm. that's how I wanted Watchmen to feel. But then the delicacy of coming back in after hours and trying to pick things up and, and clean it up. And that was immensely difficult and challenging, but that's the job. And I think just going all the way back to your original uh, uh, Obama, Mark Marin quote, which mm -hmm. is that's all well and good as long as there's not an iceberg coming. Um, and <laughs> in television writing, there is icebergs everywhere. Touche. Obama, <laughs> you know, and Obama's quote makes a lot of sense, but there was a huge iceberg um, that was on the two degree turn and right. maybe a 50 degree turn was called for. That's and right. I, I hope, That's I fantastic. hope that we're in the midst of a tectonic change. You know, I hope we are, but here we are, you know, 24 hours after Jacob Blake was shot six times in yeah. the back and paralyzed. And here we are again. And we know that we'll be here again. It's not, it's not, it's not a matter of uh, if, if it's a matter of when, and so has anything changed when the Missouri couple who were brandishing automatic weapons had prime time real estate on, on the Republican National Convention last night presenting their side of things? Right. I, 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 I hope so. But we have to keep, you know, we can't let up <laughs> is the is the is the I, I say I say two degrees is not going to do the trick um, as the hugest mm -hmm. Obama fan uh, there is. Sure. No, and I think the, Mrs. America did a great service in, in tying those very subtle uh, ties to early 70s. I mean, it's, you know, around that Southern strategy, but you had cameos by uh, Roger, St Roger Stone and, and uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was great to, to sort of connect the dots to how we landed here through Lee Atwater and, and all of it. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I mean, at the risk of being reductive, one of the things just for the, for the sake of the, the people that are watching, I mean, ostensibly it's writers and, and it's working writers and, and aspiring writers. And like, I just want to sort of encapsulate what was just said is that the difficulty is the point that it, that, that it, it challenging TV is challenging writing that these, that these are the people at the top of the game and they are feeling so challenged that they have to take two day breaks or they have to step away and they question if they'll ever finish. And I just want to say that out loud for writers watching the, the difficulty is not the obstacle. The difficulty oftentimes is the fire that, 
you have to go through. Um, did, just as a, a final question before we go into Q&A, in just a few minutes of Q&A, um, thank you for your time. Um, did, carrying all this stuff around with you, because this, this is heavy stuff for all four of you, um, just lifestyle, you know, now we're in Zoom and, and I, you know, of course you were writing this before Zoom, but I mean, did, did you, did this sort of like find, absorb through your lives and you know, particularly you, Susanna, were you, were you kind of carrying this as like a backpack around for a couple of years or did it not play like that for you? You know, weirdly, it didn't play like that for me at all. There was almost um, a kind of euphoria in mm. taking this horrible thing by the neck and really kind of trying to wrestle at least a little bit of it to the ground. And, and you know, we had an amazing team. You know, we had Michael and Ayala. We had other great writers. But it, it just, the whole team was so fired up to make the show yeah. that it, it was not, it, it sat on me very lightly. It actually filled me with um, energy. Uh, it was, it was really exciting to do. I don't, and, and even, look, there were days when we were shooting scenes of sexual assault. Obviously those are different days. Um, and, and, and those are, that's its own, that's its own process. Um, those were four days out of 75 though, you know? And, um, and I think we all so believed in the value of our work that, uh, that it really wasn't a heavy, it didn't feel like a heavy load. Mm -hmm. How about, how about the rest Our of point. you? Did you, did you feel the, the weight of your, your storytelling in your everyday lives or how did you carry it around? I, I will just say that I, I think that that's one of the, you know, I think one of the m most amazing things about being a writer as a profession and also working in writer's rooms is that it is a place to just sort of get out all of this shit. And it is a place that it, it's a dialectical exercise. You get in there and you talk about these very intense things and you talk about America and you talk about politics and with a bunch of smart people who, who you respect, hopefully. I think that, um, so, you know, despite the fact that we were dealing with heavy themes and, 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 very serious issues that to me is one of the you know to get in there and, and to use Susanna's word wrestle wrestle with that stuff and then make work out of it and and hopefully make something that that you are very proud of and you think is good is I think that's a blessing I I, yeah. I uh yeah that's great Tanya or, or Damon any thoughts I think thank you I think um you know, it strikes me that it feels like as a panel, we, we all have a sort of instinctual drive, you know, which is actually nice. I'm listening to you guys going, wow, that's, I, I want to write this down, you know, what, what everyone's saying. And I think that there's something in um, that, that the writer's process that becomes, it becomes so important important to sort of stay with the material even at the point where sometimes you're like can I can I take a break from this because you're spending all this time making this imaginary world feel real as real as the real world and so that's an incredible amount of psychic energy but also like release to do that so I felt like not necessarily a burden I mean, I felt a burden to do a good job and, a, and sort of like humbled and scared to write some of these stories because these are so, such important people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that thing of keeping the voices, you know, in my head was, was there all the time. And I think it is for, for so many writers. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just second, um, uh, what everyone else just said and 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 I think that you know whatever your intention is going into this stuff if you're you're you do have to this is kind of Susanna was talking about this earlier as she said that she just felt it neck down and I think that you know when you when you fall into the next story that you're going to tell 
and I, you know, whether you're a writer in the room or, or a, one of the performers who's, who's working on it or the editor, you're choosing this thing, you know, um, most of the time because the landscape is so vast now, it's not just to get a paycheck, it's because you have some sort of romantic attachment or draw to it. There's, there's something about that story that, that makes you feel like you have to get something out or, or, you, or you know how to tell the story even if you can't explain why. Um, but then once you get in it, very often you have this experience of feeling like you're, you're in way over your head. Mm. For me, you know, it, I, I liken it, the metaphor that I, that I always, you know, liken it to is I feel like I'm on a high wire, but I also simultaneously am the net. <laughs> and it's so that idea <laughs> of I, I have to catch anyone else who's falling off of the wire. Um, and, and I have to forget mm. this every time. Um, when my wife and I had a had a, our son and we were going through, he basically slept for like the first week and then he woke up and we kind of went through this intense experience of like, well, we don't have, what do we, we read all these books, but what do we, what do we do? And we would say to all of our friends, like, why didn't you tell us about this? And they were like, oh yeah, 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 we, right, right. And you, you, you just forget. And so I think that I, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to forget about what it was like inside of Watchmen, but I do know that the subject matter was something that we knew that you, you don't just like, you don't just end the day at like seven or seven thirty when everybody breaks and then you're just like, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, go home and order a pizza. I think everybody brought it home with them. We all knew that that's what we were getting into and, um, and, uh, and it stayed with us. I will say that the, there was a degree of escapism where it's sort of like, um, you know, where you find these like, moments of humor uh or wackiness that allow you to sort of take a breath from it's like yes uh the show was a meditation on on um on white supremacy and um and systemic um uh inequity racial inequities as it relates to policing also there's a guy who coats himself in lube and slides into sewer grates <laughs> um and so like we tried to we tried to find ways for the story to not always only be super duper intense. And those were kind of like the most fun that we had in the writer's room uh, was, was kind of cooking up those, those sort of absurd constructs. It's fairly sad for our country that so many people learned about Tulsa through a superhero show. I mean, that, that alone is sort of like speaks to, you know, how these, this medium sort of has access in ways that, you know, other mediums, media don't. But uh, we just have a few um, audience questions. And uh, and uh, this one is, you know, a little lighter. We've been pretty heavy. So uh, uh, what's your favorite ice cream? Just kidding. Uh, it's from Nikki Ackerman. <laughs> How do you know if the show you're developing should be limited series, episodic, or feature? I think this is a good question for this panel. Everybody here is very multimedia. Um, we have a playwright. We have a journalist, an externalist. We have, um, you know, feature writers. Uh, how, how do you... How do you find the right format for the for the story? Anybody? You know, I had a moment of thinking that uh, Unbelievable would be a good feature, um, but it was only a moment. And I, I think Michael and I yell at and Sarah Timberman, our other partner, saw it um, as a as a limited from the get go. But that's sort of I, I've come from there. So that's sort of where stories first park themselves. And then you, mm -hmm. you do a little thinking about it and you think of that relationship and, and how much more you can do with it if, you know, it, it has more than, you know, than the limited time you have in a, in a feature and, and things like what, you know, the, the information we learned about police and, sex, and sexual violence and domestic violence. And you just think, oh, you can't jam that stuff into two hours. So you just, it starts to expand in your mind. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's sort of, uh, for, for me, becomes a matter of feel like, okay, I, I can understand how it's bigger and then I can understand how I can shape it so that it will it'll have some dramatic propulsion. But, you know, I, I started in the two hour space, but I mean, it was maybe a half hour thought before I realized there was a lot more there and that it did have a narrative drive that would that would hold people. We had like a, um, like a seven season plan for Watchmen, but then we realized we would never ever beat Succession in drama series. Like, <laughs> like we're just gonna cap, we're just gonna we're gonna cap it at nine. 
and then <laughs> and then we'll just convince everybody that was no i you know i i think that the the opposite of a limited series is an unlimited series yeah and i and i think that you know as 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 great as it is to form relationships with characters over longer arcs you know and and love the the, the both the comedies and dramas that do so having done that uh, for drama series, I did a, a show for six seasons and another show for three seasons. I think that the idea of saying you come in, you have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, you give the characters real conclusive ends to their arcs. It doesn't mean that there can't be some ambiguity in that ending, but I think that the idea of knowing that this group of writers, we're never going to be able to put them together again, or this group of actors, or this group of incredible directors, and so, and so say like I just need your attention for like a year. And then, mm -hmm. and then when you get close to the end of the year, you say six more months, please. But, um, <laughs> but like, I think that the energy of just knowing that we were going to just do the one season was really transformative. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, it, and it really, it really powered the, the storytelling. And I, I, I don't know if I can ever go back. I have to be honest with you. I think mm -hmm. this is, this is, this is the way forward for me personally. Yeah, it's really like capturing lightning in a bottle, as you say, you know, with the limited. And I think that um, there's something that you can do. I mean, certainly I was just thinking about what Susanna was saying. Like, I, I thought like, if your show had been um, a movie, I wouldn't have got the, dis the, the sort of discomfort, the important discomfort that I got. Um, in the in this series and, and for certainly for Miss this is America, like the, the, the story of the feminists, we see it episodically. We see like each, we sort of hone in on, yeah. you know, each one, Shirley, Bella, Gloria, Jill, you know. Um, and, and so it feels episodic, the story that we're telling with the feminists, but it's actually, you know, as Damon said, you really have, we have an arc. It's, and so that by the end, the feminists, start and end in very different places, as does Phyllis, yeah. that they sort of go like this. And so like in my episode, where you're really seeing the fracture with the feminists and we're seeing the way in which they can't unify um, and that they have a lot of um, I, wonderful ideas, but they haven't got to the point that they get in Houston in episode eight, which is sort of the maturation story really for Bella and Gloria in a sense of sort of saying, oh, now we can speak with one voice, but we're not the same. And we and we know that, and we're not trying to be in lockstep, that we're, um, that the inclusiveness that they come to by the time they get to Houston is part of their journey. It's mm -hmm. part of their sort of hero's journey in a way. And we couldn't have done that in a, you know, obviously this story, because we're doing a decade, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked in the same way. It was really important to tell it in one season. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, but I think, yeah, I think the story tells you what it wants yeah. to be. Yeah. Uh, Cord, you toggle between half hour and hour. Um, you know, does your brain bifurcate when you look at a, a subject matter and think, is this a comedy? Is this a no, I think that we're, I mean, I feel incredibly lucky to be working in this era of television because I think that sort of viewers are savvy enough now and the, and the zeitgeist has shifted enough that, that you don't have to think in those terms anymore. Like half hour, an hour just seem arbitrary to me in these days when you have shows like Succession and Barry and um, I May Destroy You, like all of these things, like whether it's a comedy or a drama, or, like it, it's meaningless, right? It's just yeah. like whatever the person thought would be best for the story that they wanted to tell. And I think that audiences now care less and less about that also, that what is a half hour versus an hour, what's a comedy or a drama. It's just, people just want something that's good. So I feel incredibly lucky to be working in this era of television because I don't think you need to make those decisions anymore. Right. Yeah, a lot of the, these almost feel like novels, you know, like with chapters, like it, it, it's sort of like, it's it's a loose genre and yet it feels satisfying in that way you finish the last page of a book and you shut it and you sort of have that moment where you want to like marinate in the feeling of having just finished a novel um we have two minutes um i can just ask this one last question if anybody wants to was there was there resistance 
um, from the executive level. I mean, I know that Watchmen was something that HBO was hunting down for years. I don't think this version of it was what they had envisioned all those years. Um, but what, did you experience resistance in the execy level of it all? Anybody have any experience with that? I'm just going to quickly say none. Not a bit. Uh, CBS Productions and, and, and Netflix were so eager for this. You know, we sent them the article at 10 in the morning and by noon they were all in. It was, and, and nothing but a tailwind from start yeah. to finish. That's worth mentioning and applaud, applause yeah. to them for that. Yeah. We have the same experience with both Warner Brothers and HBO. I, um, I, when they came and, 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 and said, do you, do you want to do Watchmen? Um, you can kind of do anything with it. Mm. Uh, um, and, what, what, and I just said anything, and uh, <laughs> they said sure. And so the 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 entire show became a you know sort of a test to see if I could make them regret saying that word, <laughs> and uh, and they never did. And they were always the first people to kind of hear a lot of the ideas. Um, you know, going over to HBO and pitching to Casey Bloys and um, Francesco Orsi and 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 Nora Skinner and. And, and sitting in a room with them and saying, do you guys know what happened in Tulsa in 1921? And for them to say no, and to, to, to their, you know, they, their reaction in that room is basically the same thing that happened when the show aired, you know, almost two years later. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think that, uh, you know, the support was tremendous. And I'm not just saying that because you're supposed to say that, um, this this is why uh to echo what cord said we're in a really exciting age because i think that there's a lot of trust um and an understanding that in order to break through um in order to achieve not just a level of you know what the water cooler effect but also also authenticity i think that the reason that you know that tanya and susanna are are sitting here right now is because their shows are speaking to something that's that, that feels authentic and real um, about now. And people are wanting to find a, a way to focus their attention and, and talk about this. And they do th so through the vessel of a television show. Um, right. It's still the, the best way to, to aggregate a collective conversation about these sorts of uh, complicated issues that, you know, uh, that are, are very timely. I mean, Cord was talking earlier about Will Reeves couldn't uh, get, uh, Ex had needed to, to, to get extrajudicial justice in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Mm. Here we are in 2020. And, uh, and so I think all of these things will very much of the now and, uh, and it's a testament to, to, to everyone that they, they've achieved this sort of level of zeitgeistiness on the executive side. I think that, yeah. that they all recognize that. I think that's a great place to, to stop. We're, we're out of time, but um, the good thing about awards is viewers. That's the definitely good thing about awards. And I'm so happy that more people will be tuning into all your shows. Tanya, Cord, Susanna, Damon, thank you so much. And congratulations again and good luck in September. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Thank you, thank you, for thank you so, much. Thank you so much. Everybody stay safe. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.